Romans 1 and 7 makes a statement as Paul's writing. And I, to all that be in Rome, I think we, we read stuff, stuff so much that we, we, we neglect what that means to be a Christian in Rome. <laughs> See, because there's something about us saying, oh, it's so hard today. It's so hard to live for God around my friends or so hard to be a Christian with, in America and it's so hard to be holy or separated unto God. But Rome, uh, Paul's writing to the church in Rome. He, he makes a statement in Romans 1, 7. He says, do all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Right. Let me just be past here for a minute. Oh, it blows my mind how many people think they're called to the ministry, but they ain't called to be a saint. Come on, Pastor. Called to sing, but ain't called to pray. Called to sing. Called to, oh, I meant, get me behind that pulpit. I get called to do, called to be this, but they can't put up chairs. Called to be this, they can't make a dish of food. They call, called to be this, but so, well, all right. Grace to you, and this is an encouraging message, stick with me, but we do have to, we, can't, we just can't leave it all out. Grace to you and peace, God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the Corinthians church is also called to be saints. That being said, let's go to Philippians chapter 4. We'll begin at verse 21, but 22 is our key verse. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you chiefly, they that are of Caesar's household. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. To the Philippians, written from Rome. And if I wasn't feeling them, I can't even hear what's going on. I, I would, I said it fine a couple times today, but Papaphitis, or however, I can't do it right now. But verse 22 says, All the saints salute you chiefly, they that are of Caesar's household. Let's place our Bibles down. Let's, if you're called to be a saint, let's place your Bible down. Let's lift up our hands and talk to the Lord Jesus. God, help me tonight. Help me to be a saint of God. Help, help me to truly live up to that calling. And before anything else, before I'm a pastor, before I'm a church secretary, before I'm a, a church song director or media operator or whatever other title, God, I'm called to be a saint. And no matter what place, condition, or circumstance, God, I'm called to be a saint of God. And God, we thank you for that. Give us the strength, the understanding, the revelation that we may live up to that highest of callings yes. to simply... And plainly be a saint of God in Jesus' name. God bless you. You can be seated. I do want to premise, filter everything I say tonight, whether I'm leading you into a thought or out of a thought with this. You won't find expressions such as we can't do that or we can't afford that in the book of Acts. Y'all need to get this sound adjusted because that, well, that, I didn't know whether to jump back or talk louder. The church, and I'm not talking about the building, the church saints, the people, have always marched forward under every circumstance. There's an old saying that, that says time heals all wounds. Time doesn't necessarily heal it. You seem to mature around it. But nevertheless, it's a good statement to take to heart. Because when you look back at a situation, as the wound heals, there's a tendency to think that it was not as difficult as it was. We look at the history of the book of Acts, first century church, in much the same way. We kind of tend to romanticize the early church. 
There's a tendency to think that it was all miracles, signs, and wonders. And in fact, most think it was just one continuous victory march after another. You got 3,000 being saved and 5,000 being saved. And time has a way of softening the difficulties because if you've lost someone, you may be able to talk about it today, but there's a time you didn't. It doesn't mean it's any less, but time softens things. And, and it, it takes five minutes. That mom may be screaming, giving birth, but five minutes later, she holds that child. That's all. So time is really relative. Five minutes, five years. It's this time softens things and allows us to maybe understand or look at things one way when, wait a minute, maybe we need to really remember how that really was. Case in point, a lot of people talk about the good old days, but at, during that time, you weren't calling them that. Time softens the reality. Those early church saints had some massive setbacks. They had dilemmas of life that they had to overcome. Difficulties, trials, pain, prisons, devils, demons, demon possession, hypocrites, backsliders, wishy-washy folks, carnal people, contentious people, unteachable people, people that just, you name the condition. <laughs> they all found their way into afflicting the early church. Let me say, faith has won its greatest conquests on the difficult and sorrowful fields of battle. And Paul, writing to the Philippians, declares, we salute you chiefly, they that are of Caesar's household. Wow. Epaphroditus played a key role in biblical history, even if his name is not immediately recognizable to you and I and even more difficult to say. He is mentioned by name twice in the book of Philippians in one of Paul's prison's epistles. He is one who delivered the original manuscript of the Philippians to its original recipients to the church of Philippi. He was involved. He knew Paul. This extremely short and single verse is a great witness of those who served the Lord in difficult circumstances or unfavorable conditions and surroundings. I know we sit here today, and, and I don't know if I'm expressing this, but we wait for perfect circumstances to knock a door, to teach a Bible study. We, we wait for all sorts of things to align up before we actually do the things that saints are called to do. It's almost... Out of the ordinary for uh, pastors asking for this and pastors saying to do that. And no, I'm really not. The kingdom of God is. It just, I just happen to have to be the speaker about it. Uh, get, get mad at those things because they're saying the exact same thing I am. Get your Bible. Throw it on the ground. All I'm doing is preaching what it says. This past Sunday I spoke about Joseph being in a pit, and yet, despite every setback, he stayed true. When we think about Paul's mindset, it's amazing to read the book of Philippians and understand that it was written while Paul was in a Roman prison. Paul, while in prison, wait a minute, what? If you're in prison, doesn't that mean it's time off from Christianity? Hold on now, because I don't want you to incriminate yourself. Just let me finish what I'm saying. Some of you jump and say, amen. You really don't even know what I said. Just slow down, because I want you to understand what's being said. Listen to here. I'm going to preach and teach regardless of how you respond. But I want you to, this is, this is algebra. I don't know about you, I had to pay attention. You start adding letters to numbers, and it's got to make mathematical sense. I needed help. So what we're going to do here, we've got a lot of people that are saints, that are Christians, but we've got to get the letter involved in the activity, and our activities don't match what the... you got all this stuff you're doing, and ain't none of it for God. We need to stop and analyze ourselves and say, wait a minute, are we still called to be saints today, or have we been absconded or excused from that? 
I say it from the standpoint of being a pastor that you guys can do a thousand things wrong and you know I'm going to love you, but I do one thing wrong and you're hitting the door. Because I guess the pastor's called to be a saint, but the saints aren't. That's kind of brutal, but it's brutally truth. Just ask a parent. Kids can do a thousand things wrong. Parents do one thing wrong. Well, you're not a good parent. Well, are you a good kid? Well, we'll leave that one alone. You got to admit that we can confidently say if we were in prison, we'd be looking for some encouragement, some help from the outside. Man, I sure wish he'd call. My pastor, he's supposed to be calling me. I'm sick. Huh? I'm in prison right now. Uh, I, boy, he needs to put something on the books for me. <laughs> right? He hadn't, he hadn't done this and he hadn't done that. But here's Paul. He's in the prison. And he shows us who, who we should all aspire, especially those to any degree who think they're leadership. To take note that even though he's in prison, he cares enough to take time and effort to continue to reach out from prison to encourage others. You want to find out if you're a saint or ain't, go through something and see what your life's still about. Can you, are you, do you still care what goes on with the saints of God? Or can you be out of town or busy doing something else and you don't give a rip what's going on here? Are we so, has the enemy, and it's the enemy, I'm not blaming anybody, do we get so self-absorbed that, ah, ain't my problem now? Then was it ever real before? If you were in prison, would it be in your heart to write to others to encourage them to serve the Lord? Or would you take the mentality, man, bless God, they need to be writing me letters. I I preach this right now because I just went through this. Up in someone. Can't we, like Paul, a true man of God, turn any desperate place or situation into a pulpit that can still exalt the Lord no matter what condition we find ourselves? Or we all become despair, whether saints and pastors and preachers and Christians. I noticed that we alter church service. We did that a whole lot. And I, I'm so thankful. God forgive me. And I hope this doesn't bother anybody. But I'm so glad the holidays are behind us because they're, they're, they're not breaks for church folks. Some of you, you haven't done any more. Well, that's on you. But I know a lot of us are busier than all get out. And we may alter our weekly service schedules for holidays, but that doesn't mean church is actually literally canceled, does it? Because... Those that are still determined are lost, reach the lost, still do. Yes, that's right. Amen. Amen. My, my title, my position has never changed my spiritual condition. I've got to reach somebody. You, you, and I, I'll give you some help here because you, you're, you're hidden out there. But if there's something about you that you don't give it another thought, I, I'll tell you what. I would get back to praying through into the Holy Ghost and allow God to speak through you because if that's gone out in you, you're like those five virgins without any oil. It ought to to hurt us and bother us. There ought to be something about us. Where is so-and-so? Hey, man, I had some visitors. Were they there? There, We can be, there ought to be something. If we're the real deal, some of us have just turned our Christianity into coming in and being critical of everybody else, are critical of what's going on, or critical of what's planning, but you're doing nothing. And I, I, I hey, I'm going to be honest with you. After battling this sickness Sunday night, man, I, I was like beside myself. And yesterday, beside myself, and I was getting really frustrated because I wanted to be here tonight. And I thought, man, this stuff. I, I wrote this, and I don't want to offend anybody, so I'll encourage you here in just a minute, but. The bottom line is it reveals who's a faucet and who's a drain. If all you do is you're critical, especially if you're critical and analyzing me. 
The sad thing is I say, can you do better? Some of you think, yeah. But you have to understand there's a word called that begins with this spot too. Philippians says in verses 12 through 14, but I would that you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. Wow. He didn't qualify. He didn't say all the good things that happened to me for, happened. They furthered the gospel. <laughs> wow. Has what happened to you further the gospel? Because you become critical of its author. What happens to me needs to further and promote the word of God and give glory to God. We're all, you're not going to not go through stuff. It depends on your mindset before and after. Every one of us, if we took a wrong mindset, has an excuse to go sit in a corner and be skeptical and critical and analytical and bitter. Or the power and the, and the mandate of the apostolic truth and God's holiness and Holy Ghost of power compels to say, wait a minute, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Like Paul being stoned and drug out of the sea, stands up and goes back in as a man. I'm called to rise above the inches of life to glorify my God and Savior. Well, I'm going somewhere. Paul goes on so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the. No, look what he says. The palace. One of the greatest struggles in this country right now is the palace. The main house in this country wants to do everything it can to destroy this meeting right here. You can hear it. You can say what you want. And I'm going to be on Neither party's got it right. Just because one sounds a little bit better to Christianity, you better get off that soapbox. You're going to talk that soapbox right into a pine box and end up in hell because you talk more about that than you do about this. you got more opinion about that than you do about this. You're, you're more, we know more about you about that than we do about this. I'm called to be a saint. I'm glad I'm in America, but I want to die a saint of God, not American citizen. You can take my citizenship for this country and disqualify me and throw me in jail, but I'm mindful of another country. I'm mindful that I'm called to be a saint of God. You need to throw that music out. You need to throw your politics out. You need to get that on all the rest before you can get and before and get back into an altar and get yourself renewed in the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues and become a fiery witness to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because it's bigger than the red, white, and blue. It's bigger than all that other stuff. Some of you condemning yourself by how much politics you know and you don't know who Jesus Christ is. You used to know. And I've touched on this thought before in Philippians, but Paul conquered his doubt. Wait. It was there. It had to be conquered, Brother Bruce. His flesh was there, but it had to be conquered. If you think that any one of us that's doing anything for God is not still battling that, give me what you're taking, because wow. We all have environments, circumstances, letdowns, and setbacks. Environments that are hostile. But the evidence from Philippians 4.22 helps us to understand that there are others besides Paul who did the exact same thing. Regular folks, just like you and I, surrounded by ungodliness, surrounded by worldliness, surrounded by every vice available, still living for God. Young people, I don't care what they're doing out there. We don't need to be doing it in here. Ladies and gentlemen, I know what they're doing out there. We don't need to be doing it in here. We don't need to be acting like, dressing like, listening to what they're doing. We need to realize I'm called to be a saint of God, whether the earth's on fire or it's in a flood. Amen. 
We got to go all in, be unstoppable, determined, committed to the cause of Christ. Thankful, prayerful, helpful, and hopeful. Called to be a saint. If you stand up and have no more adamancy about any other position on this planet, you are misplaced. Paul was locked up in prison. But there were saints locked up in Caesar's household. Prison bars shut Paul in. But these other saints were shut in and surrounded by lavish surroundings. Oh, that's different. Well, wasn't it wasn't for Joseph. Old Testament Joseph, man, Potiphar's old lady's like, hey, come on. He said he wouldn't do it. It wasn't against the law. It wasn't against the Ten Commandments. He could have slept with her. Law wasn't written yet. Well, I've, I'll go by the, these people that want to bring up the Ten Commandments. Look, I, I, I love people, but you have to understand, some of you, you, you need to understand the Word of God's bigger than any of us. Deeper than any of us. I mean, you want to go back to about tithes, about the law? Man, you bet. They paid tithes long before the law was ever written. They, Joseph wouldn't commit a trespass against God long before thou shalt not commit adultery was ever written. Some of you understand, when you're called of God, you're called of God to do what pleases him. You can't put that down and pick it up according to your earthly station. Either you're called to, to magnify him. I can't take a seat from that. I don't care if Brother Christian's doing announcements or Brother Joe's opening or someone's preaching. I'm still called to magnify God no matter who's behind the pulpit. If Paul knew in prison and he's going, wait a minute, I'm going to encourage those even in seat. They're surrounded by everything. They got everything at their disposal. Let me encourage them. Am I the only one that sees that? See, some of us, we got so much lavishness around us. We want to sit back and watch. Paul will stand up in that day and condemn you. Paul sat in prison with nothing and preached the gospel to those surrounded by everything. Oh, my God. That ought to, that, that ought to, if you got hair on the back of your neck, it ought to be doing a jig right about now. You ought to run, wait a minute. My God in heaven. Paul, Paul was the, he got a hold of something. Maybe I need a Damascus experience again. Maybe I need to get refilled with the Holy Ghost again. Paul was faithful in prison. And the saints were faithful when they were confronted by a palace of power godlessness, sin, and opulence. The tendency might be to think that these folks who were in Caesar's house had everything at their request and that things were easy for them. Being surrounded by so many temptations with the inability to say, no, I'm called to be a saint is a true test. You may be able to afford it. You may be able to have it. In America, we can just get to this about anything you want. But it determines what you really want, God or whatever that is. When you look at Caesar, who was doing what he was doing, we realize these saints had a challenging place to serve God. Between Caesar and Nero and the lifestyle. It was not helpful to the church. Historians, Seneca and Burris, Roman historians and philosophers, both record that Nero's first years were marked by a mild use of authority. He kind of eased into the position and was kind of given to every kind of gracious act. He kind of started out kind of mild. One of the first things he, that he had to do was sign a death warrant for a criminal. 
Seneca records that when Nero wrote that, he said, oh, that I never learned to write. But time passed. Things changed. Not only with him, but some of us. Oh, we used to be. But now we're, you fill in those gaps. Those aren't for me. I'm not calling you out. You need to call yourself out if you're not where you should be. You better work out your own salvation with fear. I ain't calling nobody's name. I ain't single nobody else out. No, that ain't my job. I'm going to single me out. I'm going to work on me. But time passed and this, 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 I don't know if docile is the right word, turned into a raging menace to the church. Once he tasted that, that authority and that power and the blood, he, he became like a shark and he literally he was literally became enraged, and the only thing that was satisfying was more blood. When you consider some of his some of his actions and some of the things he did, he, he poisoned his stepbrother Britannicus. He divorced his wife Octavia and banished her, but he still ended up finally killing her. His lover, Popea, who later became an empress, she, she, she became pregnant. Suetonius writes that while she was awaiting birth of her second child in the summer of 65, that is literally 65 as they kept dates, she quarreled fiercely with Nero over his spending too much time at the races. <laughs> Come on, fellas. He walked back in the house. Boy, if he had a Bible, he might have stayed out of trouble. If it Better to be in the corner of a rooftop in the house of the raging woman. And she laid into him. Well, they didn't have the popo they could call back then like they do today. In a fit of rage, he beat her down and kicked her to death in the abdomen. Yeah. The one that at once said, Oh, that I never learned to write. He changed. Changed. He would take baths and exotic oils and he was enthralled and embroiled in, into the basest, most disgusting and carnal of lust. There was no pollution of body or, or, or mind that Nero didn't get involved in. His history is just revolting. But if you think about it, it sounds just about what's right around the corner here in the United States. And so we may not be saints in Caesar's palace, but right now, we have access to just about anything and everything. And the big question isn't that. The question is, are you still called to be a saint? And you're surrounded by the provision of America. Rome was accustomed to hearing of immorality and crimes, but the excesses and vices of Nero shocked them. The Roman church called Nero the Beast. Tacticus, a Roman historian, actually saved a portrait, a painting of Nero driving his chariot through the Vatican Gardens. And he's weaving his chariot in and out of the columns with saints that were tied to him. And as he weaved them, he was slashing and killing the saints. And they were soaked with tar and set on fire. You can't live. You can't live for God because you're too busy. Facebook and toys and busyness, and finally, which was poetic, Nero committed suicide, and the world was free to one of the most depraved monsters who ever lived. You have to understand, though, that this is the type of man that was challenging the saints at that time. Horrible leadership, depraved leadership. I said all that to help you realize, I hope you would listen and realize that even though all that was going on, the church was growing. The church was still, well, even under all of that, the church was still, people were still believing. People were still living for God. People were still sacrificing everything to propagate and to tell someone else about the love of Jesus. You would expect fools and philanderers and adulterers and murderers and seducers and other kinds to, to be prominent in this 
house of debauchery. You think those people would be prominent, not saints. But the church was growing. The, the church... The church was blossoming. The church was, was booming. And here's the great apostle Paul writing that there are saints in strange places. Listen, if you're going through something, if, if, if you're the only one on your job, if, if you're standing like a beacon of light in darkness, yeah, because God put you there. Because a church will shine in darkness. It, It doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter. And even as the world turns and becomes worse, God determines that the church will rise up. It's going to happen. Someone's going to find Jesus and give their life. And God will call someone out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Hey, Saint of God, don't settle for the gray when you can become the light. God's going to raise up a church right in the middle of a mess. Don't be afraid of trouble. Don't be afraid of problems. Don't be afraid of circumstances. I I have a feeling that more often than once, that any secluded, isolated, even lonely, Paul felt like he might have been an absolute failure in Rome. He probably wondered if anything effective was being accomplished with his calling and anointing. Oh, is someone hearing me tonight? Why? Why am I? Why am I praying here in this dungeon? Nobody knows. Why am I writing? They may never get this. Why don't I just stop and become a self-preservationist and see if I can't get more food down here, more water down here, just, but he didn't do that. Oh, maybe I'm just by myself here tonight. Maybe, 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 maybe these chairs are just too comfortable. I don't, I don't know. Maybe the air conditioning. I don't, we, we bought into all this stuff and we go home to houses that are just as padded and... <laughs> Paul kept writing and he kept sending, he kept encouraging and he kept believing and he kept, he stayed faithful, stayed committed, and he's writing letters to people that are surrounded by all this. But thank God there were still some saints that didn't buy into Rome and they bought into that heavenly hope that, that God has promised us. Paul was a saint God to count on. That just doesn't sound Doesn't sound wonderful, does it? You don't write that. You don't put that in lights. Nobody's got a poster. I'm a saint God can count on. We like stuff like, I sing. I preach. I'm called to minister. We find our talents and our giftings or whatever it is we think we're good at, and we want to be promoted by that. But yet in the middle of all this spiritual warfare and carnal carnage, there's a there's a man of God that 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 that, that's like it doesn't matter if anybody sees it, it doesn't matter what everybody knows, it doesn't matter what anybody says. I'm someone God can count on. Opulence isn't going to distract me. Uh, The palace isn't going to persuade me. I I got a job to do. The prison's not going to discourage me. Uh, I'm going to write and I'm going to pray and I'm going to reach out even to those in the palace and those in the prison. It doesn't matter. Everyone everywhere needs a man of God, a lady of God, a saint called of God. To say, there's something better than this world has to offer. We're called to be saints. We're called to be saints. Lay aside whatever opulent thing you've got or whatever status you may have reached or you like to brag about in the world. I'm going to tell you something. When that great day happens and you're called out of here, I hope you're called to be a saint. 
I hope you're called to be a saint. Ain't no one going to care about your athletics. Ain't no one going to care about your looks or what you attained. Ain't no one going to look at your bank book. Ain't no one going to look at nothing you've done. The biggest thing, are you called to be a saint? Now, I know. I know. It'll hit me. It's going to hit me. Tomorrow morning, Layla, I wonder. Did Layla just think I'm a fool? Did, 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 did Sister Verdell go, my God, hey, just go rant on the same thing again? Brother Sister Dapport sitting there critical, wondering, I don't know. I, I think I can do better. And Brother Bruce going, man, he needs to let me up there. Huh? I don't know what you're going to do, but tomorrow it may just hit me. And I may think that maybe I'm just a rambling fool, but I'd rather read out of the Word of God where this old boy in a prison wrote to those that had everything and wrote to those that had nothing. He didn't know that they weren't making a difference. He, he couldn't tell. He was locked down, but he kept writing. He kept doing it. He kept going. He kept praying. He kept being a saint of God. He wasn't waiting for someone to call him a saint. He was being a saint. His prayers, his tears, his songs, his sermons found their way all the way up into the palace of Caesar. Jesus. What a difference one committed person can make. Are you hearing me? Hey, people, you never know how far it's going to go. You never know who it's going to reach. Paul was a prisoner. He was locked up. He was living on prison rations, isolated in darkness. Yet he was, oh, he was taking on all the wealth of Caesar's palace, taking on all the corruption. And he kept living for God. Kept living for God. There will be those surrounded by the abundance of all the American stuff and things. And there's still going to be those that refuse to get distracted. And will have a love for God. Right under the nose of a corrupt administration. All because they knew they were called to be faithful. Because they were called to be saints. Despite all that he faced, his faith abounded. His faith was alive. Despite everything against him, other believers stayed faithful. That there were saints of the Most High everywhere. There were saints marching in the armies. There, there were men and ladies living for God, working in the open air markets. There, there were slaves and convicts despite their chains and whips that still served Jesus. There were centurions in the Roman guard that were believers. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came a new centurion beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of a palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shalt. Ah, ah, ah. He, this tells me he knew a little bit. He wasn't a casual guy, just one. He wasn't just showing up to church, just give me healing, Jesus. I don't really care about none of your business. Just do something for me. Oh, would that God, we never settle in that spot. I'm not worthy that I should have come under my roof, but speak the word only. Oh, my God, if some of us will quit living opinions and quit living political stuff and all the other junk in the world and get back in the word of God, that's worth living for. That's worth writing for even in a prison. That's worth standing for and saying no to all the stuff in a palace. The word of God. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. Do you realize he just described how we're supposed to be? How many of us? How many of us take the words of Jesus and lay it right over and, and let it, allow it to shove away our opinions and our distaste and our critical spirit and our critical and shove it aside? I don't care what I feel or what I think or if I'm in a prison or a like God said to do this. If he wants me to go, I'm going to go. If he wants me to pray, I'm going to pray. If he wants me to sing, I'm going to sing. If he wants me to teach, I'm going to teach. If he wants me to preach, I'm going to preach. If he wants me to write, I'm going to write. You don't think that's powerful? Listen to Jesus. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled. 
There's a whole bunch of people that they say they're mine, but they don't have a faith like that. I wonder if there's any in the church tonight like that. Maybe you've become embittered by the things of this world, and God said, you never would have got embittered if you didn't get it all tangled up in it. You had a preconceived idea of how the world was supposed to treat you. When I told you, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words all see. You bought into the wrong. Get back purchasing in the word. Get back and buy into the word. This will pass away. That will pass away. You're going to pass away, but his word won't. He said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. (laughs) Jesus. Oh, man. Mighty God, mighty God. Called to be saints. Called to be saints. Saints in those those days had had jobs and occupations and duties that were menial. They had no attraction. They didn't have great titles like human resource director. They didn't have great titles or great opulence or great wages. and all. They didn't have all. We look for, oh, I'm this and I'm this and I'm being promoted. They, they didn't. They, they said, one that way. They were subordinates. They, they work of the palace in every nook and cranny. These saints had their blood licked up by the wild lions, tigers in the arenas of entertainment. These same saints had their their, 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 their fleshy bodies served as fodder for swords of gladiators. Saints of the Lord Jesus Christ lived in the house of Caesar. They averted their eyes of the horrid evil that took place around them. And in the debauchery, holiness still stood. They ignored the foolish fads of their day and prayed always with all their hearts. They didn't caught up with the things of this world. They they didn't have a subculture in the subculture of society. They were saints of God. They they weren't buying into this ideology or buying, oh, I'm over here. I'm a little rock and roll. Oh, I'm a little country. Or I'm a little this. I'm like, God, we're the ones that are called to be saints. uh, Look like saints. Act like saints. Talk like saints. Faith like saints. Write like saints. Pray like, oh, where's the saints today? There ought to be something about us. I'd imagine as they were in, in, in that, in that palace, you know, when Paul's in prison, they were looking See, back then they had a little fist symbol that they would draw to say where the Christians were. They had a little box-type circle symbol that they had. Rome had these little patches of Christianity. They walked around. They weren't looking at the opulence of being more Roman. They were looking for those little symbols. See, see, today we can we can freely walk around as a Christian. And it's a sad day. I gotta preach about being a Christian. I got to preach. It's funny. Some of us say, you can't listen to your genre of music, but I'll listen to my genre of music. And ain't none of it Christian. Because we're not looking for the little, the little things of God in a world that's so full of debauchery. Oh, is there any saints called today? They were looking for every shred of Christian candy. They'd look. They'd be passing in the market and go, there's Sister Tia. Yeah, there's a meeting tonight. Oh, there's Sister Verdell. Oh, oh, there's Carol. Yeah, we're going, we're going to be meeting tonight oh, over by the fish. That's over by the fish market. Or it's over here. We're, we're going to be, we're going to meet over in this house over here. They, they, they weren't broadcasting it. They didn't have a YouTube footprint or a media footprint. They had to look for every other thing because if you missed that, you were dead. These people were knit together. Oh, they cared about one another. They loved when they were there for one another. If someone was hungry, hey, we need to get some food to this house, and we need to get some provision over here. We got a saint locked down being hunted here. We got to get them across the city over here. Oh, they were knit together in unity because their survival depended upon it. I have not said this in years, but I'm going to say it now. One of the worst things that ever happened to Christianity is they stopped killing us. And so you got little frickin' frack fighting in the church. You got carnal people complaining about every little thing but not doing a thing. 
these Christians were surrounded by pagans and from other land, other lands and full of superstitions and all this other idol worship. They were surrounded by people with crazy practices of pagan worship. And they, they, oh, they, God, it was ridiculously gross. But it made their worship even more pure to God. I know America's got a lot of stuff to offer, and I, I hate to break it to you, but I'm I'm glad we're here. But some of us are some of us are too glad we're here. You got everything America has to offer, but you're not walking in step with the Lord. Oh, I don't want to miss him when he comes because I'm too busy in step with the carnality of my flesh and what I like. Our worship is pure to God. Come in here with your problems and your pain and worship while we still can. Listen, there was one who was na- named in Caesar's house, was Onesimus. He was a runaway slave. He had robbed his master in Colossae and had fled to Rome. Paul wrote back to Philemon and told him the wonderful news that he'd been converted. It's a great story. Others we find listed in, in the final chapter of Romans, chapter 16. And Paul finishes out this great letter, and he, he, and he brings this gracious salute. Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant. Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ. My well-beloved Epetheus, who was the first fruits of occasion in Christ. Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. And Jonicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles. Ain't hey, none of you knew them until I read them tonight. And Pleas, my beloved in the Lord, Urbane, our helper in Christ. Psycheus, my beloved, Apellus, approved of Christ. Aristobulus, household. Herodian, my kinsman, the household of Narcissus. Tryphena, Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Persis, which labored much in the Lord. Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Oh. Centricus, Philegan, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Philogius and Julia, Nurses, and, and a sister in Olympus, and all the saints which were with them. Timotheus, my work fellow. Yes. Lucius and Jason and so, Sosipater, my kinsman. Tertius, who wrote this epistle. Gaius, mine host, Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, and Cordus, a brother. What you're doing for God is not overlooked. What you're doing for God, God sees every little bit of it. Oh, that we got some people called to be saints here. That when you leave here, it's not a, what can I do until I come back here? It's about, oh, I'm going to be a saint to, all the way until I make it back. To, I, I'm called to do more than just make it from service to service. I'm called to be in service for the Lord every day that I live, every footstep that I'm granted, every breath that I get to breathe. Every, oh, I'm called to be a saint in these last days. There'll be one day that splits the clouds and it'll all be over. So no, he's coming on a cloudy day, just so you know. It's going to be better to be a saint than LeBron James. Than Willie Nelson. Than Elvis Presley. Lady Gaga. You realize how ridiculous those names are going to be yes. next to? These are the saints of the Most High God. They don't want to put your name in the newspaper. They don't want to put it in. They don't want nothing to do. But one day they're going to realize you had everything they ever really needed. Oh, but how can you tell them that if you sit here today disjointed and unsold out to the fact that you've been called to be a saint? But right now, oh, it don't fit in too well with my palace. Let me bring this to a close. I know we're getting late. But who's Cordus? Paul I know. And Timothy I know, but who's Cordus? It's our brother. Just one of the seemingly obscure members of the church in Rome. The epistle begins with Paul and it ends with Cordus from the loftiest to the lowliest. But every one of them were brought closer to each other by the love of God. This man had his name in the book of life, but he passed through life unnoticed by most. 
maybe if he'd have been in the military, he'd have a uniform to boast. Maybe if he'd have been a big businessman, he'd have gold to point at. Maybe whatever, whatever it is that floats your carnal boat. <laughs> but you see, when he walks in, he's Cordus, and he is the man the world needs and needs desperately, needs supremely. The world needs a Cordus today. Hmm. A brother, yes, a sister, a saint. Quarter, quarters may have been weak or even feeble by himself, but when he unites with the brothers and the sisters of the church, he becomes a part of a group of the mightiest force in the world for the greatest cause that ever existed. Oh, for a church family tonight uh, that would rise up and spread out and speak out uh, weekly on the same mission that as we depart from here tonight, each member stepping out, reaching and recruiting and loving and instilling a revival. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, under the nose of an ungodly world and an ungodly administration. Court us like you and I has to decide you can serve or despair. You can hide or you can hold on. Much like you and I. I know. I know. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm not the most important person in this church. The next visitor is. Amen. Amen. I, I, you know what? I, I appreciate everything's being done to, to honor the past. I'm going to tell you something. I, I get all that, and I understand the premise behind it. I know the Bible behind all that, but I'm going to tell you something. The most, that, the most important person that walks in this church is the next visitor. The person that needs the Holy Ghost, the person that needs to truly know Jesus Christ is their person. I, I, I'm not the most important person. You're not the most important. You're not. I don't care how loud you get. I don't how good care how good you are. The most. If you can ask God right now, who the most? Who's reach? Who are you reaching for? Let me get another one. Come on. Back. Say it again. Come on. Jesus. The enemy will tell you your feeble little efforts. They'll even be saints of God when we announce something. They'll snicker at it. They're trying to do this. They're trying to do. Yeah, we're trying. Yeah. We're trying under the yeah. nose of a palace that would do love nothing but to persecute us under an administration that wants to snuff us out uh, under a world that loves nothing more than to silence us. We're going to try anything and everything because we need to reach one more, whether we're in the prison or in the palace. There are people called to be saints in these last days. And I'll say this, leaders alone can't do it. You're on a fool's errand if you think it's all got to go through you. If you have a church, and if I had a church, yeah, we need to fail. This ain't my church, this ain't nobody, this is his church. Mm -hmm. Paul couldn't do it alone. That's why he was writing letters. That's why he was encouraging. That's why he's telling someone, live godly, live soberly. Leave yeah. right to, come on, saint of God, come on. You're called. Get out of that. Don't, don't get involved in that over here. Live holy. Live, don't, don't get attached to the things of the world. I get it. How can I mean anything? I'm just a drop in the bucket. Well, so is Cordis. And so is Paul. But if you keep adding drops to the bucket, pretty soon it's a full bucket. Oh, I'm just a grain of sand. That's okay. Let's keep adding sand. We'll have a whole beach. Oh, my God. Oh, if someone would hear what I'm trying to say tonight. Each name, each person, each one of us by itself seems insignificant. If you'd realize together around this room, I see a part of the army of God that still marches home. Oh, I see a quarter in every corner. Hallelujah. I see someone right now that if you'll get a hold of this thing, 
you will mean something for all eternity. You'll have a legacy that lasts long, long beyond this life. We've been called out. We've been summoned to service. As we all stand, it's our turn. It's our turn now. And I may hack this poem up, but I'm going to do my best. We may not be the best shrub in the valley, but be the best little shrub on the side of the rail. Be a bush if you can't be a tree, and if you can't be a bush, be a bit of grass in some high way and a happier make. If you can't be a selfish, then just be a bass, but be the liveliest bass in the lake. We can't all be captains. Some have got to be crew. There's something for all of us here. If you can't be a highway, then just be a trail. If you can't be a sun, be a star. It isn't by size that you win or fail. Be the best of whatever you are. Difficult circumstances come and go. Difficult days will come and go. A difficult life should not discourage anyone from being a saint in Caesar's house. That single verse about saints in Caesar's house gives us all hope. When we realize the environment, the surroundings. Some of us even want to blame our upbringing as an effect. But, and that may have some truth to it in some cases, but it's never completely true for a child of God because he makes all things new. There is something that each and every one of us can rise up to do, to be. It's a matter of which challenge you choose to take. To be prominent in a world that will reject you. Or to stand up and hear the calling to be a saint. That is the quest of Christianity from the very beginning. And if the Lord could ever capture your heart or capture your heart again, he will help each and every one of us to overcome the places that we've been immersed in. Jeremiah had such a raging fire in his soul that he couldn't shut his mouth. Joseph guarded his soul in the house of Potiphar. Obadiah kept his conscience in Ahab's house. Daniel kept his in the court of Babylon. Nehemiah kept his heart in the Persian courts. So it's up to you and I this day. This day. You right now, this day. Called to be saints. There's courage found in these saints who served in Caesar's house. Courage that would bear wrong but commit no wrong. Hear that. Courage that would rather save life than be critical of life than destroy it. Courage that came from a clean conscience. Courage that could go in and out of a wicked company and not compromise. Courage that ignored the threats, absorbed the sneers, and turned away from the bait of temptation. A courage that lifted an innocent face to an executioner's eyes. Courage, courage to stand on God's side and bravely hold onto the breastplate of righteousness. Modesty was still found in the saints of Caesar's house. Consistency was found in the saints in Caesar's house. We ought to love the things of the kingdom of God so much that we could all serve with noble distinction as those saints in Caesar's house did. If you're going to be a saint in Caesar's house in the year 2022 and beyond, you're going to have to begin to change your thoughts about whom you are about whose you are, about what you're doing and why you're doing it, if you're going to make it for the long haul. A writer wrote in a leadership journal several years ago about the pilgrims 
five years after they landed in America. They, they landed on the shores of America with great vision and determination. And it showed in their actions at the start. The first year they built and established a town. The second year they elected a town council. The third year the town council proposed to build a road five miles into the wilderness for expansion. In the fourth year, the people criticized the proposal as a waste of public funds. It's a waste of funds to continue to build, Pastor. You see, they couldn't see the big picture. It was pointed out that they once had been able to see across oceans, but now they couldn't even see five miles. Has that happened to you? You can see the eternity in heaven, but you can't see what the church needs to do today? One of the best ways and the only way you're going to change your thinking and to change your spirit is to saturate your life with scripture and prayer. I'm going to say this. We got to quit being prayerless. Better get back into prayer. We can't be dancing and being foolish on the threshold of eternity. We better get a prayer life back. You can't keep 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 running as usual, doing what you did. You're gonna be like Samson, get up one day and it'll all be over. It's time to restore prayer. It's time. Some of you grab a hold of the horn. You stop. Can 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 I can I be can I be real? I'm not reaching to hurt. I'm reaching because you're supposed to be saints. Yes. Amen. Beacons, cities. That God sits on it. People that God takes people that need him and they point to you. I believe with all of my heart that day when I was screaming on my bed, the day that I was told that my dad was dead and I didn't know God, no nothing I got, and I said, oh God, save me and help me. I believed he grabbed a young Matthew Monroe and set him on a trajectory to walk in where I worked to give me an opportunity to be called a saint. Anybody here ready to hear from God to get put on a trajectory that you can reach somebody? Can I ask you tonight? A napkin or a towel? A napkin or a towel? A napkin denotes that you want to be served and satisfied and wipe your mouth of all the opulence of Caesar's palace or America. It's all about placement. Lord Jesus. I come to an altar to find that place of service all over again. Let me read somebody. Let me be a saint again. Let me get back to that place where I'm walking with you and talking with you. And that I am that city you could point someone to. I'm that saint and you could put in a prison to reach somebody. You could put me anywhere and I'm going to reach the lost. I'm going to turn the world upside down because I'm a believer.